Hello, welcome to Scuttlebutt. The Scuttlebutt stops here. I'm Nick. Or does it keep going? I, I don't I think know. We... I was trying to make fun of the O'Reilly factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually have a list of like eight of them, of eight awful uh, Yeah, I think lines. it stops and starts it here. Starts it's like we're the alpha and the omega. Of the I just want to be the scuttlebutt. Yeah. You know, my goal after, uh, you know, right before we achieve world peace through podcasting <sighs> is... Uh, so we're on the cusp. <laughs> we are on the cusp. Oh, yeah. No, we're still be around because there's always going to be Marines. There will be scuttlebutt. Once a Marine, always yeah. a Marine. Scuttlebutt, always scuttlebutt there's yeah. always yeah. going to be a scuttlebutt. Uh, but the goal right before we achieve world peace through podcasting, of course, is to be the premier scuttlebutt on the Internet. Um, very and, quite literally. And for all of those tuning in, you're a massive part of that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, but today we have our first uh, non-veteran guest. Yeah, this is going to be a, uh, this is going to be a fun one, I think. Um, yeah, our first non-military member on the show. Um and quite an esteemed guest at that. Yes. So the guest in question is an actor who has played vets a handful of times, five, six, seven times. I didn't count them all up on his IMDb page. And he goes way back with our good pal Vic here. It's the only way we can book those guests right now. <laughs> we're not the only <laughs> – we're not the premier scuttlebutt just yet. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's a long line, but, you know, we pulled him out of the, out of the crowd, yeah. right? So, but because Vic and our guest go a little ways back, he was able to nab him. And you may know this guest from such films as 12 Strong, uh, which is why we nabbed him. Right. Uh, which is based off of the book Horse Soldiers, which takes place immediately following 9-11 as we were trying to get military personnel into Afghanistan uh, to start our response. Yes. Um, have you read the book? 12, uh, 12 strong, uh, horse soldiers. Yeah. So th it's a, uh, it, it's a nonfiction book. Um, and like, like you're saying, it takes place, uh, in the aftermath of nine 11, as we were trying to figure out how to respond to the attacks, um, on the world trade center. Um, and yeah, so, oh, and the guest in question is Jeff Stoltz. Um, and as you mentioned, he's, uh, been, an actor, uh, celebrity extraordinaire for quite some time, has uh, done a few things. Um, he played a uh, Thunderbirds pilot in the movie um, She's Out of Your League. Obviously, he uh, plays a Special Forces operator uh, in 12 Strong. He was uh, one of the hotshot firefighters in the o movie Only the Brave. Only the Brave. Um, he uh, played a former or he played a staff sergeant in the army uh, who was reassigned to a National Guard unit in a, um, in a comedy uh, a sitcom called Enlisted. Uh, he played a former ranger uh, experiencing PTSD in the show The Finder. Um, so, yeah, we thought it would be really cool uh, not only to get some celebrity chops on the show, but to have someone who's not a military member but has occupied that headspace um, and just to get some of his feedback and experiences having um, been exposed in, uh, intimately with the military but not actually having worn the uniform himself. And so I thought this was a fun interview. Oh, what would you guys think? It was a great interview. Highlight for me is the part where he was talking about the advisors. Yeah. On a, I can't remember which one he started on. was Enlisted, probably, and how uh, he kind of picked up on what they were telling him was good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, after that, he just gained a whole new respect for him. But I don't want to speak too much about that. Yeah, and then just for our listeners, um, yeah, Jeff presents himself as he always does, uh, just – uh, and Jeff in life, but uh, in this interview, you know, extremely well, not extremely, but it's very candid. Um, in some, some respects, it's refreshing, uh, but in some respects, it could be a, like, a little jarring, as most. And I think, Nick, you mentioned it before we started recording is, is that oftentimes when speaking to celebrities or people in the public view, there's a, there's a veneer mm -hmm. and uh, there's a persona that they are trying to um, present. And it's very filtered, uh, and it's very rehearsed, and it's very um, 
uh, I guess, uh, orchestrated, almost performative. You're not going to get that from Jeff. <laughs> like no. One thing about Jeff is there's nothing performative about yeah. it. Um, and so just enjoy the candor, the unfilteredness, and, and just really sort of the, I mean, the salt of the earth. Um, yeah, uh, The way that Jeff sort of talks about things in a very real, unfiltered way. Yeah. So have you guys seen the movie 12 Strokes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it, we talk about it a little bit in there. I felt like, you know, going to the technical advisor aspect of it, there was – I thought it, there was a lot of really great um, presentations of military. I thought technically it was done very well. Even the use and the weapons handling, the weapons employment, yeah. I thought – yeah, and Jeff mentions it too. Like, yeah, of course, when you have Chris Hemsworth, there's going to be him riding the, shirtless. The on money the, shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, shirtless on the back of a horse, you know, with a, yeah. with a, you know. And that would be my biggest complaint with the movie is there are some of these, I think there's like three or four of these like glory Hollywood money shots. Yeah. Um, that kind of. But you don't have that kind of meat and not show it, right? Yeah, yeah. So you gotta, so you gotta do a little bit. And when you, so a lot of the reviews for it, if you're looking at the reviews, talk about they're very mixed. Some of them are love it. Those people probably also read the book and or whatever. And then there's the people who just think it's like a jingoistic mess of a mm -hmm, movie. Mm -hmm. And um, I can kind of see where they're coming from just based off of those like four shots. Yeah. Of like American military splendor and slow motion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in action, but, but like it, everything in there, from what I could tell, the veracity of it is accurate. So, but that's a, yeah, that's the thing. It's a yeah. real event, and I yeah. think that one of the reasons, also one of the reasons, I wanted to have him on is to present this in a public forum that this is a real thing. Like this yeah. really happened. These are pe these are guys who felt heard the call and responded and did what it took to make it happen. And yeah. It seems like American exceptionalism on the surface, but it really did happen. These guys really did mm -hmm. go in and really did all make it out. Any other thoughts on anything related to Jeff? Uh, no, I just again have fun with this. This is uh, this was a, a really sort of um, yeah a gloves off sort of interview. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, guys. Well, Vic went to town with Jeff for quite a while. So sit back, strap in, and enjoy. We'll catch you on the flip. Bye. So welcome to another episode of Scuttlebutt. I am more than honored and so happy uh, to be here with Jeff Stoltz, actor extraordinaire, life coach. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, call me up. I'll make all the good decisions. Uh, the scourge of uh, NFL Europe, uh, Prague, or uh, was it? Che where, where, where was that? Czechoslovakia? Uh, the uh, close to <laughs> Close to Nyberg mercenaries outside of Vienna. Yeah. Real, real big time stuff, bro. Yeah, man. I mean, th this guy is, uh, he's walked the earth, man. He is a, he's salt of the earth. He's walked it. So a uh, good friend of mine, Jeff Stoltz. And man, thank you so much for being on the show. It's so great. Um, you know, as we were talking in the pre-show, uh, it's been a long time, dude, since we've uh, gotten together so i'm just gonna keep doing more podcasts so i can just keep getting you <laughs> on the show and we can at least maintain communication this yeah, way that's so a good idea <laughs> nothing nothing productive will be said on that podcast yeah man well you know thanks to the pandemic like the only adult interactions i get is through this podcast so uh it, more of a reason to have it is just so i can talk to other adults but to also to reconnect with some of my really close friends so thanks again dude so much for being on the show I'm proud of you, man. This is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, so, I mean, I don't know where to begin. Uh, I don't want to go too far back. Um, but, yeah, Jeff, you have been, I mean, you started, Kai, remember, what was it, 1998, you and your brother said, hey, we're moving to Hollywood. Yeah. And in a classic Vic moment, I'm like, I don't know if that's such a good idea, dude. <laughs> You were right. You were right. I should have listened to you. I what are you talking about? about? While you were looking, while you were looking for an apartment, a what was it? A soap opera agent stops because you guys were like, like, 
Vista Cantina or some shit. It was called uh, it's called Red Rock, right on something. You've been you've been there many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, Red Rock. Oh yeah. You yeah. guys are just grabbing a bite, looking for an apartment. She stops in traffic and is like, "Here's my card." And then like, it wasn't for me. She passed. She like elbowed me out of the way to hand it to George. <laughs> she wanted nothing to do with me. I just kept showing up. George was like, "I don't know. I'm good looking. I don't know. Uh, what am I supposed to do?" Are you buying me a drink? We can talk. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I mean, we I mean, and then from there it was like it was what seventh heaven, then um, well I mean yeah. just tell us a little about yourself, man. Yeah, I mean that really is a true story. Um, I can't take credit for it because I wasn't there. George was actually there by himself. It was a Saturday afternoon. Remember at that point I was still really trying to get picked up by a team in Europe. I, my plan was to go to law school. The only law school I would have probably gotten into is Whittier because they would have let me in with like shittier grades because they owed me one. Um, so I, I was uh, I was going to take the year off and try to get go play in, in Europe um, just because I just wanted that experience. And George was planning on finishing school and then joining the military. Um, yeah, that's right, but, man. We were going talking to SEAL recruiters and stuff. Yeah. yeah. But remember, he had to, because he transferred, he still, when we walked the day you got commissioned and I got a diploma, well, you, you obviously got one too, but George didn't. <laughs> it was empty because yeah, he still yeah, yeah. Had to take, um, I think he had to take, I think Arabs and Muslims might have been the last class. He needed more credits. So we had to take that summer school session. So while he was still in LA that summer, because if you remember, we had the lease on that house through like August 1st, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So he, he stayed there. <clears throat> um, and then that he was having lunch in Hollywood with our girlfriend, Sarah. Um, and that's really how it happened. So we got the card. And then I came back in town and he was like doing laundry because, oh, I've got to tell you this woman. And I'm like, you know, meanwhile, for the last four years, I was like showing up, freaking dancing, trying to, trying to do modeling bullshit just because I wanted to try to get in the industry and I had no idea how and dummy ass George is just sitting there eating a burger and got uh, got an agent. So that's really how it started. Um, she started representing him. I would go with him to his auditions. I'd kind of show up. I'd call, I'd do what they call crash them. Um, this is after a year you were in out, you were playing, uh, playing ball in Europe for a year and then yeah, you came home, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, in that interim, well, we got the apartment and a couple months later, I went to Europe, came back that that following June, uh, June or July, I guess. And then uh, and then I was like, well, I'm going to give this a shot, give this acting thing a shot, because I didn't really have any other plans at that point. The, the Europe thing kind of derailed law school. Also, I realized I didn't really have any skills uh, and I wasn't smart and couldn't read. So I was like, I'm like, I better, uh, I better make this acting thing work. Now we, we really, we really thought it'd be like, we'd do this for a couple of years for fun and then go get real jobs. And then one thing led to another. And it's like that, that thing I talked about, like you get, I, I really do believe that luck has a huge part of the, many businesses, but this one, being at the right place at the right time and being prepared. Now you have to create your own luck in a certain, uh, to a certain degree, you really do, but you have to be, and you have to be prepared when these opportunities come up and not suck. But um, really that's what it was. I just had some opportunities and I, I had some opportunities. I booked a couple of shows and it was just enough in the beginning to like keep me coming back. So, and then the next thing you know, you turn around and you're like, and I thought maybe I'd try to go back to Europe, um, and I realized that was, you know, that was that was going to go nowhere other than having fun. I couldn't really pursue a career as an actor and be gone for eight months a year in Europe, making you know like twenty five bucks a week <laughs> playing football. Um, but uh, yeah, and and that's really how it started. The first the first real job was Everybody Loves Raymond, and that was a small little one time right. thing. And then little job, little job, guest star here, co-star here. And then Seventh Heaven was the first long-term thing. And then, at, um, yeah, and then randomly they were looking to cast a love interest for the other sister, the girl that um, Beverly Mitchell, who plays Jessica, played Jessica Beale's sister. And she was like, just got a brother. And that's how they ended up writing George in. Um, 
And then it was, then I left that show because I booked my own show. So I was like, I don't need you guys. And then that show didn't get picked up. And I tried to go back to Seventh Heaven. They were like, we don't need you. Uh, like, oh, another great, great choice by me. Yeah, uh, I, I just kept, kept rolling little by little. You know, it is. And then the next thing you know, it's like, it's 20 plus years in. You were over saving the world and I was ruining it. Yeah, whatever. I think I think I single handedly extended the war at least five more years. So I think we're we're both in the same boat in, in that regard, man. Well, um, we'll get into some of your work, especially as it pertains uh, to the military. Um, and then obviously with everything uh, going on in Afghanistan, you know, you've got a uh, an interesting perspective on that. But um Growing up, I mean, we talked about George's interest in the military. Uh, obviously, you were you were a part, a huge part of my early accessions uh, into the Marine Corps. Like, so what were like growing up? I mean, Colorado is known as a you know very patriotic state. Uh, you're right outside of uh, Air Force Academy, yeah. so um, you know. So, what were your, some of your perceptions of the military growing up? You know, I, I I don't know if you even know this, but my first choice. As a sophomore, junior, I was really trying to get into the Air Force Academy. I was trying to get my, uh, you have to get nominations, congressional nominations. And I, I think I think they were like, hey, you're almost good enough. You can go to the Merchant Marine Academy. <laughs> and I was like, but I want to fly stuff. And I also, and I would have done the prep school and all that. And I, and I did really have that acting bug in me that I wanted to pursue. So I knew if I went to the military for five years uh, or to school and then served afterwards, I would have never done this i probably should have done that but um yeah so growing up in colorado springs we've got fountain fort carson which is that huge army base then there's peterson air force base and then the air force academy so there's a large military presence you know and you know my dad he's running around with the uh, flags so we're, we're, we're all patriotic all the time my dad the guy that if he sees anybody in a uniform in a restaurant he buys their meals and you know, like he thinks that anybody that's ever worn a uniform is like there on D-Day. And my dad, like that kid's, he, he's, it's, it's 2021, that kid is 19. He wasn't in World War II. <laughs> <laughs> the military has always been something that I've been fascinated with, particularly because of my interest in the Air Force Academy. I, I wanted to play football there. It's such a great environment. I, um, yeah, I think I would have, well, 44 year old Jeff, who's gotten away with, you know, being an actor for the last 25 years, I would, I'm sure I would, my mentality would struggle being told what to do all day, every day. Um, but the reality is, is all of us are getting told what to do all day, every day. It just comes in different ways. This yeah. dog runs my life. The girlfriend runs my life. Um, but I, I, that is something I always wanted to do. And my brother was fascinated, really wanted to join the, the SEALs. And, and you know what? I, I joke a lot. I really do wish that George would have done that. George is a, uh, like the most productive and happy I think he's is, is when he, like when he was wrestling or when he's in college and he knows he's got a schedule. And some people are not self motivators and they need, the need like structure. And George is a person like that. Now when he's working, he's so much better off than when he's not. Think about it. Like when we were in school, I always got better grades during football season because you didn't have time to screw around. You had practice and getting work done. And then as soon as we were, as soon as the season was over, it was all like, nah, I got time for that. You procrastinate, you just don't do anything. And then, so uh, I, I think structure is good for people. And I, I know I'm tangenting like crazy, but so as a, as a dude that tried to make a jump and get into the entertainment industry, there was a, opportunities to play military people on television and film. And that's where I felt like, all right, I, I didn't actually go join the military and do anything good for the country, but maybe I can at least portray the men and women in uniform correctly to the best of our ability um, and then try to contribute that way just in a general overall morale or, or just the perception of the military. Now, granted, I did that. The first thing I really did in a long-term capacity was that goofy Fox show called uh, Enlisted was kind of about the, the rear D, about the three brothers in the military. But I think the slogan was something like "We're actually soldiers," or <laughs> so it was. So, I forget that the log line was "We think we're soldiers." The National um, Guard unit, right? It wasn't the story around the National Guard unit? Yeah, we were like. So my character was supposed to be a kind of a, a hardened, tough guy, but he 
uh, and he was overseas. I think he was in Afghanistan, and he knocked out his commanding officer. And so then they just demoted him and sent him back to the rear D to run in the platoon with his fuck up brothers. Um, it was fun. Uh, and I, you know, it was interesting. I was, we were all worried a little bit that we were going to get some flack because it was really important to us to not make, um, take a situation like, you know, like anything, like being in a locker room or you, I mean, you know more than me, you, you were um, on the ground with troops for 20 plus years, but even in the most tense situations, there's got, there's levity, maybe even more when the, the more crazy it is, the more you have to like make things you got to loosen up somehow or you're just going to turn your hair's going to turn gray. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know who you're referencing. So, yeah, no, no, I mean, I, nobody. I was just saying that definitely comes through in your work. I mean, and I thought it was really interesting. And, and, and by the way, dude, this show is all about tangents. So like tangent away, man. Um, so, okay. but the thing I thought was really interesting is you mentioned the air force Academy. Cause I, I really feel like your portrayals of soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines um, has been really genuine. And, you know, I think even back to a comedy that you did, um, she's uh, out of your league, right? You played a, a pilot for the Thunderbirds, right? That was my probably my first example. And you got to now, as I've learned, you know, pilots are a little different. They're, they're a little different breed. They probably think they're all cooler than they really are. See, they're like actors, man. We're like we're, we're prima donna. When I went out um, and embarked out on the, uh, I believe it was the USS Ronald Reagan. And we went out and stayed for a couple nights and we watched them do night sorties, night takeoffs and landings out there. When the pilots were on on the deck, like the rest of the crewmen were like, they treated those guys like they were the, the rock stars. And I'm sure that's the way that like, you know, the special forces people got get treated in certain places. But uh, I was like, oh yeah, I like this. I want to I want to be one of these guys. I want to be one of I feel like they're eating better. Um, well, you get eight, you have mandatory eight hours of sleep, so it's always fun. Yeah, that's great. Like, you know, who can do that? Nobody can do that. Nobody does that, though. On, on She's Out of My I remember the first thing. So my character's name was Footlong, which is the greatest character name I'll ever have. And, and that's the first example of why Hollywood lies, because it's not even close to a foot. <laughs> 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 but I appreciate it. The best thing that's ever happened to me in my life was at the premiere. I'm walking. It was in Vegas. And I brought my girlfriend at the time there. And then we were walking through Vegas. And somebody in the lobby of a, one of the hotels was like, yo, foot long. And I was like, yeah. Uh, the guy that was the actual pilot that did the flying for me and that brought down the Thunderbird, his call sign was T-Bag. And I was like. Is that what I think it is? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And like he wants, and he like wants to show you how, like, no, I understand how a tea bag works, man. I, I, you don't have to. I get it. I get. It. You have to demonstrate. I, but I didn't really realize that you could get away with that kind of stuff. Um, you know, maybe, maybe twenty years ago you could, but uh, you know, I, it sounds like uh, the the world is changing. Some ways good, some ways bad. Yeah, but to to go back to kind of the portrayal of things, I've always been very aware of how things are perceived and to try to be as even though like something like she's on my league is a broad comedy obviously you still try to you don't want to do anything certainly that portrays uh people in the military in a in a negative way and because of that we've always i've always been lucky to have really good advisor we talked about i know there was a chance there was a, some talking about that at some point that maybe that would be some somewhere you might end up going when we did Enlisted, we had some guys, and and to be honest with you, I was really annoyed a lot with them because we were trying to do a comedy. We're trying to do a comedy about the military, and we they'd get the scripts and they'd sign off on them, and we'd get there and we'd block a scene, and then they'd be like, "Oh, sorry, you can't do it like that." Well, because he couldn't be standing on this side of him because he's lower ranked or higher, whatever. So, and I'd be like, "Well, we're the fucking a. We're just it's a joke. Like it's like let's get through the day here." Or they're like, you know. Asking with you about your hair, and I just, it's a comedy on Fox. Nobody cares about these stupid things. And then, and I used to butt heads with them. And then, the more I did, and the more after I started watching them and started listening, hearing feedback from people, I started to appreciate that them more and more. Even though it created annoyance in your day as an actor, like you're doing, I'm looking at like the business side of it. 
all that really matters doesn't matter how miserable our days were or how great they were doesn't matter unless people watch that damn screen and we get ratings that's what it really comes down to because if there's no ratings there's no advertising if there's no advertising your show gets canceled um so I, i'd be like ah, god those things just don't matter but when it came to we started reading the blogs and started hearing from people my direct messages people talking about how what a good job we did then i was like okay I res respected those guys a lot more. And then I ended up doing another job. It was just a pilot that didn't go, and that same team was on there. And they didn't hear me complain one time on that one because I knew that they were looking out for us. And then when you go do a show like 12 Strong, that wasn't a comedy anymore. We're like, you know, we're dropped in what would, was supposed to be the mountains of Afghanistan, and we're trying to portray those guys of uh, horse soldiers. That's when having good military advisors means everything because you know at that point too it wasn't that long ago those guys are still alive they came we're playing real people they were on set it's important to portray american military people in a good way because those movies get seen across the world you know and like and we're we've got a uh, i think we've got a public image problem with uh, america in general right now in the world we really leaned on the guys that had been there before, the guys that had done it. As a matter, one of the guys that was in the movie, he didn't have that many lines. He was the 12th dude in our our squad, or our, our platoon. His name is Kenny Sheard. He's a former Navy SEAL sniper. <clears throat> and he, he was a stunt guy, but they hired him to play an actor. And he was so good, even though we were playing Rangers, he been boots on the ground in Afghanistan. He was in Iraq, and because he was kind of one of us, when we would block a scene, the advisors would be like, do this, this, and this. We'd all kind of go, Kenny, and Kenny would go, eh, I wouldn't do it like that. It, that he, he was kind of the guy that we all, and it got to a point actually where the director would, would call Kenny on the weekends, and they'd go out and talk through big battle scenes and things to just for authenticity. Um, because like anything else, there's politics involved. It was produced by Jerry Bruckheimer. Bruckheimer's got a guy that he's been doing war movies with for 40 years. The guy's name is Harry, but Harry, and Harry was the Navy SEAL, but he was a Navy SEAL in Vietnam. Things change. Um, so, you know, protocols and things and just the way things operate. So there was some stuff that we were like, even I, as a guy that didn't know what the hell I'm talking about, I'm like, are you sure? That doesn't feel right. I'm going to bring this up only because it's really timely. Another thing that's really important, um, and this is just, a sad, couldn't this terrible all around, and that the, the shooting of the poor director of photography in uh, in that western and in, in New Mexico, um, you know, mistakes like that should never ever fucking happen. But even on our movie, blanks, people forget to take them out of your gun. You're walking around. It's a it's fun. It's jovial. Like you know, you're dicking around because in your mind, it's a fake gun. It's a fake movie. And then. People forget, and then blanks go off. I had one of the actors was joking around; he should never do this, and he pointed the gun for a picture at my at my dick, oh. and then he got yelled at by the. It was after they cleared all the guns, and he's like, ah, and he got yelled at for doing it, and he was like, what? It's not loaded. Pressed, pulled the trigger, and it went off. I would have would have lost what little a foot long I had left. Um, <laughs> when when it comes to to, to portraying men and women. Uh, in the military, number one, we have the luxury of research. Obviously, enlisted was fake, but you know, we it was based on the idea of of a rear d, uh, you know, a rear detachment unit um, of maybe not the most hardened soldiers in the world, but really still very necessary to the actual mechanism of the the army. But we we really have to lean on the people that know more about these things. And for us, it's obviously the writers and the producers have to go through and they have to make an effort to be realistic and authentic. But then once it comes to us, you know, you got you put your own little stamp on things. But obviously, leaning on people uh, that know what the hell they're talking about is is what keeps us from looking like total assholes. But I, I think I think there's a lot to be said though for that level of authenticity. So, like you said, like and I think it's an interesting progression. You know, going from you know she's all that to enlisted, then to twelve strong, where you know you really get a chance to like sort of cut your teeth on what you're talking about, like the the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are evolving. Like you said, I mean, something, I mean, even if I 
now were to go back and try to advise someone on how things work in a counterinsurgency sort of environment. Um, you know, like when I was training um, with the Emiratis in um, the UAE, it's like I still had to like refresh like all the time because like you said, like it evolves just like uh, like in football, like, you know, running a, you know, running a slant route, it's probably tried and true. But the way the defenses play against things and the way the offense is set into that formation, it's just not you just can't run a pro set every down. And right. so the same thing. So you got a chance to really sort of see that evolution. I think that's really interesting. And you got a chance to really sort of cut your teeth with that authenticity. And I think that that by the time you got to 12 strong, I think you really did have a, uh, a, a really uh, a firm sense of like how the authenticity is going to also affect the bottom line. Yeah, so that's really cool. And so let's talk a little bit about 12 strong. Um, it's based on a book and, you know, I think the book is called Horse Soldiers. Um, for those yeah. who aren't aware of the story, I mean, if you haven't seen 12 Strong, like I, not just because Jeff is a close friend, but like, dude, it's such a good movie. It's so great. I actually, I think I even, when I was watching it, I texted you when you were shooting your 203, just like, dude, how awesome was that, man? Like, what are you guys using for your blanks? Because you guys really did do a great job of like, Hey, just something as simple as like shooting a grenade from a 203, like you guys did it the right way. And so for, so for those who aren't aware of the movie, um, the story is like right after 9-11, obviously we had to respond in Afghanistan being a landlocked country. We had to find a way to get people in and the neighboring countries we aren't all that friendly with Pakistan and, and China. So these guys had to figure out how they were going to get into Afghanistan. And so they were able to infiltrate through the northern part via horseback. And that's sort of where the story picks up. And so what were some of your experiences with the story before um, you came on set? You know, I, I knew of the story. I read the, the original script before I read the book. The book is incredibly detailed. It reads more like a manual then it does like a, you know a piece of literature so it's it's hard to get through you just kind of knew of I mean, everybody that was old enough knows the feeling where, where they were at on when they woke up on 9-11 kind of what happened after that i remember you were already where were you on 9-11 i was um i was in uh at camp pendleton and um yeah, yeah, yeah. We had just finished PT and someone, one of the sergeants came in and said, hey, somebody just flew an airplane into the, one of the World Trade Center towers. And, you know, again, another Vic moment. I'm like thinking it was like a private airplane. Like what an yeah. idiot. Right. And then next thing I know, like everybody get into the common room. And then so we had this TV we're all uh, at the barracks and we all went in there. And by the time I got in there, I saw the second of uh, plane hit the tower hit the second tower um and then it was just like get to the armory because you know where we are at camp pendleton was right along the five freeway right and i mean we had like snipers on top of the buildings you know we're right outside of um san onofre uh nuclear power plant oh, yeah. so right. they sent they sent a, a group of um light armor reconnaissance i think a platoon or a company up there to guard it i mean it was gnarly dude it was it was super scary um, Wait, didn't we fly home to my parents, and then dude, you like the, and then you got a text saying you're going to war. You had to turn around and get get a flight. We don't you remember? That? Um, no, that was it was after. Uh, so uh, we I went home with you, and then they said it was uh, actually it was oh three. It was before going to Iraq. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, we were just chilling out, and I got a text from my OIC, and I was like, I gotta go, because uh, I'm going to Iraq. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember like you went, we went to the airport, and they were like, uh, "Good luck." I'm like, He's, yeah. let's go to fucking war. Yeah, yeah. They're like, it's yeah, you can, you can leave. Ass. It's gonna cost you like two thousand dollars. Like, what the hell? I know. It's just to go back to that, I, you know, I, I, I knew how it. I felt on 9-11, I was just a Joe Schmo. As a matter of fact, we on 9-10, I was, George and I, Will, maybe, I can't remember if there was a fourth, but we were, we stayed with Stuart at, up in Washington. We went to the Michigan, was playing Washington. 
do uh, that. Either. Yes. And so I came back from that weekend, landed, and uh, were you there? No, because I had just come back from Vietnam, so I couldn't take like any more leave. I was in Vietnam for like two and a half weeks. That's right. So that was a good time. But um, I just remember Will playing catch in the parking lot and running into a trash can. That's uh, that's my memory of the whole trip. <laughs> so many stories about that. Dude. Yeah, he, he ended up in the trash can somehow, thinking he was a great athlete. So, yeah, I mean, so I, I knew how I felt. I knew what it would be like. I can only imagine... And there was, and there was a, you know, there was a bit of a scene about that in in uh, Twelve Strong, where we're all kind of get called in the common area, and we're seeing the planes hit the hit the buildings, and no one was like, we're no one we're going after it. And then, but you know, and then part of the story of, of horse soldiers is that there was multiple teams over there vying for that opportunity, and like who's going to get, you know, and these and the, the sense of patriotism patriotism that we all felt. That was like the last time I think. In a, in, a, in a maybe forever in American history that people were actually like you know, uh, had one common goal in mind and we were like decent to one another that that went away pretty quickly uh, but you know, so, so then I you know I knew that story I knew how, how that felt and you start to we the general public didn't really know about this until a little bit later but we knew at some point people were going going over there and then seeing a little little stories of obviously there were other teams and other people that went in and did some incredibly heroic things this one you know like you know somebody wrote a book about this one oh, uh, yeah. there was a there's another kind of pretty famous book i forget the name of it about people that came in from from a different area yeah so i, I knew about this story and it was just something that i was really excited about and i really wanted to be in this movie and wanted to play those those characters so i it was like a two-year process of me chasing this job and like I had to have meetings with Bruckheimer and get signed off on and I went and did only the brave because I knew it was the same producing team that was going to do 12 strong and I wanted to anyway I was really really wanted to play this character and then I uh, got that opportunity and I was so thrilled I got to ride horses shoot guns and chew tobacco for four months it was a freaking fantastic dream where did you guys film that? Was that in Arizona, or did you uh, we shot it all in New Mexico? Actually, there was a lot of talk about maybe going to Morocco, but we ended up. Turns out, if you go south of uh, Albuquerque, White Sands, Alamogordo, uh, it looks those those mountains there really look a lot like uh, like the Afghanistan the, the topography over there. Yeah, so, the um, yeah, part for sure. Yeah, so it was a it was a beautiful. It'll probably go down as one of my favorite jobs I've I've ever had. It was a bunch of really cool people doing something they were proud of. That doesn't always happen. Portraying people that I was happy to be portraying. What what a, what a great opportunity! And and it turned out well. And I, it was one of the cool things too is when we we got to meet some of the guys that that came to set. But then when we did the premiere, did that in New York, and more of the t- the actual team was there. I got to meet the guy who I portrayed. Uh, it was it was just, and these guys were so happy. The story was being told. It was great, man. I'm, I'm so so proud of that movie. I had such a blast doing it. And those are the ones that you you get you get into acting to meet really uh, beautiful women and to get to play cool uh, cool roles like that. Well, dude, I was so proud of you for get for having gotten that role. I was so happy for you because I knew you were gonna love it. And it, like you said, it's such a cool story. I mean, it's just. There's so much there's so much to that one along those same lines. You mentioned like, hey, a lot of people were doing a lot of of this kind of cool stuff. You know, somebody happened to write a book about this one. And and we're going to have a few other guests on the show that are going to look at this same the same time period from different angles and people who were who were part of hopefully were part of uh, hopefully we'll get them on the people that were part of some of these other teams because there was a lot. Of, go- of going on. I think there was just, like you said, like the nation had really just sort of rallied around this idea that like, this can't just, this can't go unanswered. Um, and I think a lot of people wanted to be yeah. um, on, on the tip of the sphere for that one. But one of the things I want to take a step back a little bit and start talking a little bit about storytelling. Um, so like you said, you mentioned, you know, they wrote a book about this one. And so from your perspective, being a storyteller, and someone that occupies the shoes 
you know, what is that like then you're occupying the shoes now you're for something like this, you have to occupy the headspace. Like, so what is that like? Because like you said, it's not like in um, She's All That or, or or She's Out of Your League or um, Enlisted. These are like real people who did like real things. Um, and you mentioned too, like you have always have had like sort of a, a good relationship with your advisors. So what was it like then to be occupying a headspace as someone who did these sorts of things, who is still alive and like almost to the point where like your every step matters now? So it's interesting when you're, you, when you're when you're playing somebody who exists so like that, you, there's a there's a certain gravity to that because you're like you know the last thing you want is something to be like, this guy's fucking terrible, uh, <laughs> like or he did that wrong or or you know you don't want especially in these kind of situations where people were living and dying. As an example, um, that movie, only the brain. The, 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 both of these sh- movies have different names and got changed. By the way, the the reason that horse soldiers was originally based on the book, it was called Horse Soldiers. And the reason they changed it to 12 Strong is because there's an old John Wayne movie that's yep. 60 years old called Horse Soldiers. And they were like, no, nah, you can't have that name. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, so uh, so that the estate went after that and they changed the name. But I did Only the Brave um, the summer before. Uh, and that is an incredible story about the 19 men that, died in a, a fire outside of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, they're hot shots uh, and wildland firefighters for people that don't know what that is. And that was unique because we were doing that movie four years. Yeah, really at- on the heels of the incident, right? Yeah. So, and in order for the production team to get the rights to do this, they had to get the families of these people to sign off on it. The 20 people involved, the 19 men that died and the one one that survived, they had, they had to get their families. So those families were then given the opportunity if they wanted to come visit the set and see it. Now, it's three years later. Oh, I'm gonna back up. And not only did they do that, but they actually hired one of the guys that was on that crew, but was on vacation, I believe, or his wife was having a baby, so he wasn't there. So his, he, he's one of the coolest guys I, I ever met, man, random bunch. His best friend took his space on that crew while yeah. he was going to, to, for the birth of his kid and then passed away. So they they offered him the job to play his fucking best friend in the movie. Then they had two other guys that used to be on that crew that were kind of the advisors. Well. Think about it from the perspective of the families. That's one thing because they kind of came and went and met people. But this guy ran a bunch, his best friend and 18 other dudes that he's pretty tight with, real tight with, and worked on those fire crews for a while, for a few seasons. He, they're all, they've all passed away in a fire. Three years later, he is seeing those same images of those dudes played by other guys, same outfits, same fucking names on their helmets. We referred to each other as our characters' names for three months. No, that's got to be a mind f- man, for that. Uh, and I, I, I just didn't know how healthy I thought that was. I felt it had to be. A, a, so not only that, he's playing, he's seeing the, the faces and names uh, and hearing the names of, of his dead friends, played by other people. But he also had developed relationship with relationships with all of us separate. Like you know, you're, for three months, it's almost a bit of a, a glamorized uh, boot camp where you're like you're rolling for three months. You're rolling around in the dirt. You're hiking. You're cutting line. But on the, you know, on our days off, on our weekends, everybody's you get some leave. You go get hammered and have, hang out with your buddies. It was it was a weird dynamic. So then, the, the, my point on this is the parents and families of these these men if they wanted, were given the opportunity to come visit and meet us. I was fucked up, man. They'd come to set, there was 20 of them, 19 of them. So it was like one a week, maybe sometimes two a week throughout the summer that would be there. And you'd walk into the, the lunch trailer and you'd look over and you'd be like, well, oh, that's obvious. That's those people. So there'd be one of the characters, one of the actors sitting at a table talking to the families of these people and they're like so they're looking across the table at somebody that looks 
pretty damn similar to their fallen husband or mother or, or, or brother or father or son or whatever. It, it was weird. So my, my character's name uh, on that, his name was Travis Turbyfill. His wife ended up not coming at the last second, and I totally respected that, but his mom did. And it was weird, man. And we went out. I took her out. To, we, I met her at lunch. We hung out. Then I took her out afterwards. Um, you know, it, it, she she hugged me and said, I haven't felt so close to my son since he died. And like, I'm like, cause I wasn't I wasn't him, man. I was just, I'm playing him uh, in this movie. And I still talk to her occasionally. But I, I thought that, that had to be an exceptionally difficult thing for, for these people to go through. So in regards to that, it was so important that you tried to, even though in that movie, screen time for everybody was, wasn't equal. So some of these, these, you know, this was a smaller role, but um, it was important to all of us to take what we did as seriously as it, and control everything that we could control to the best of our ability. Because these are, these are people that three years ago had died and there are people that are watching, they're gonna see this they're, they're coming to set. They can see it in, in theaters. So, yeah, that, that, that was one of the heaviest ones for me. Like, this is important. Like, you know, every once in a while, or most of the time, yeah, as an actor, you're like, whatever, man, I'm not curing cancer here. I'm just trying to get, get make people give a laugh. If I can give somebody 30 minutes of uh, enjoyment in their day or whatever it is, I guess maybe I did my job. But every once in a while, you're like, all right, it's, uh, maybe it's just a little bit, it's definitely bigger than me. It's more more important than just trying to get a job and keep my mortgage paid. I mean, that was one of the toughest ones for me, just being a part of that and knowing every day, like, eh, the dude that I'm portraying loved this job. He did it to pay to, to feed his wife and kids, and uh, and he passed away doing it. And it's important for me to at least, at the very least, do, do my best to portray him the way that it would you know, do his family proud, I guess. In Horse Soldiers... None of the men on that mission died on that mission. Some of them, a few of them died later in uh, in combat, uh, in different operations. So a couple of the guys that were portrayed in Horse Soldiers were, were, are no longer alive, but they, it wasn't on that mission. So that was one of the few things, like we that, that movie was interesting because it was like, it was like an old Western, like there was all kinds of, Al-Qaeda and Taliban going down, but no Americans died on it. So that, that was actually one of the criticisms of it from, you know, like the armchair quarterback critics, like, oh, this is just American sensationalism. Like, well, read the fucking book, man. It's what yeah. happened. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's a better sensational spots. story that happens to have Americans in it, but it ain't fiction. I know. I mean, there was probably, there was a scene or two of like handsome from Chris Hemsworth riding down the hill on the horse, like, ah, ah, like looking beautiful, coming through the smoke. Like when you talk to the real guys, they're like, you want to shoot a freaking 203 over the top of a horse's head? Yeah, you get off the horse and shoot, man. Like, <laughs> or ride away. It's like, so, but you know, there was a couple scenes where I'm like, God damn, that's sexy. Uh, <laughs> even I was like, I get it. I get it. He's handsome. We could just get his shirt off. That'd be great. That's right. Yeah. You ain't going to have a guy like you're not going to have the cast that you guys had, you know, yourself included without some sexy ass scenes, man. I mean, this is how it yeah. goes. Yeah, get some sexy in there, man. It's uh, sex sells, bro. Um, but I think it's what you're talking about is important. Um, one of the things we try to capture on the show as well is this idea of like every story matters. Um, and I, I really like what you were saying about like, hey, even though there might not be the same like amount of screen time or, you know, the focus maybe isn't necessarily on this, we still need to treat these stories with the type of respect that they deserve because they matter. Stories matter. And, you know, a lot of times, especially, you know, it's like from where we're at, you know, 99% of the less than 1% that have served and go in the country and stand post and walk their, their you know, go on patrol and, face the threat of IEDs and, you know, help out, you know, little kids who need water or food or, you know, all the things that the military does within the, the scope of, of its operations over this long war. It's not necessarily like book worthy or it's not necessarily like not right. everybody was a Medal of Honor winner. Not everybody was the commanding general of some, you know, badass task force. But all of the things that people did mattered, like standing post and making sure that like, hey, you can sleep well because I'm up here. I'm not going to fall asleep. I'm going to man my machine gun. And if something happens, I'm going to shoot someone 
to keep you alive. Like all these things matter. These stories matter. So I really appreciate you taking that like, hey, this is going to not only is this to be authentic because I want to do a good job for my profession, but because it matters for people outside of myself. And I think um, in, a, in a small way, like you're helping the military sort of capture the totality of the narrative of what the military does when they deploy or even when they don't deploy. Um, as you said, like Rear D, yes, it was a comedy, but that's a real thing. Like people are at these National Guard posts, these reserve centers, and they're doing their thing to serve the military, to be part of that machine. Um, and it matters. So anyways, that's sort of, I guess, maybe not the most sexy post, but you guys can't do your job without them. It's just, it, it really does matter. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think I it's think stuff, a lot of lost. shit under the jobs, but it's part of it, it. It does, it does matter. Yeah. I think the significance gets lost because you go to Barnes and Noble. I don't know, do people even go to Barnes and Noble? But you go to a bookstore uh, or you go online to order a book, you know, all of the books are, basically badass one and badass two and you know uh but everybody has a story that matters and so anyways uh i just want to say i guess my end of my soapbox but i appreciate you taking that and 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 sort of capturing not just the story that people are telling but their points of view occupying their headspace for us so we can all get an opportunity to uh really appreciate what it is that people in uniform do uh sort of on a daily basis or in times of crises. So um, last thing I want to talk about this before we move on to another subject is some of your, as we're talking about storytelling, just some of your thoughts on like stories of the past and how, and then like this idea of capturing all of the stories that matter uh, and how that pertains to us understanding our own. So do you feel a sense that like, hey, I'm doing this movie, even something like Cowboy Bebop, there are bigger themes here that maybe somebody who, or like, uh, you know, with with 12 Strong, I may, may not have served in the military, but I do understand what it is to respond to crisis. Do you feel like there's something that transcends in the medium of acting and theater where people, you, you make this stuff accessible? Yeah, I, I mean, that's still, I mean, that, that, that's such a broad theme, but you could talk about like, even going back to doing something as silly as Seventh Heaven, which was just, a, I mean, call it what it is. It's a real, real cheesy, family friendly, cheesy, cheesy show. But what was interesting about that show, especially particularly for George, um, for those of you who don't know, my, my brother George and I played brothers on a show called Seventh Heaven Family Show back in the day. But he stayed on it for seven years, and I, I he did 200 episodes, 150 episodes. I did 20 episodes. But because he was on it, it kind of always gave me a storyline to walk back in. But because that show aired so much, and it was the kind of, and it was on for so long, it was on for 11 years, um, there were so many people that grew up on that show and even still to this day, it blows my mind. And all, when, when I'm traveling, I'm with my friends. I'm, you know, I, the last time I was on that show was it's been off the air for 15 years or something like that. Yeah, so dude, I think we I think you invited me to the Teen Choice Awards to come with you guys and you guys got your surfboards. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was <laughs> dude. that had to have been like 2002 or three, right? It was. It was. So anyway. I, I joke about that because the amount of times, especially when it was at the height of its popularity, like George and I'd be traveling and people would be like, oh my God, Doug, you gotta, you gotta meet my daughter. Or, and I'm like, all right. And like, and, and he's like, she's very attractive, man, but she is um, 15. Uh, what are you doing? Like, oh my God. Like, I'm like, guys, I just want to be clear about something. I don't write it. I just show up and say the lines. I'm not actually this really sweet guy that uh, from named Ben Kinkirk. I'm a nice guy, but uh, I, I'm not that dude. But the, they would like these these lines would uh, get blurred when you go into. It's very similar, I would say, to a soap opera where, and and I don't think they're as big as they once were. But for years and years, 
these soap operas were on five days a week. They're on during the day. So stay at home people, stay at home in particular mothers would like when they're doing laundry or like you know, hanging out with the kids, whatever the kids are napping, they're watching soap operas and they have a, they develop a familiarity and a comfort with these characters because you're in their fucking home in their, when they're in their nightgowns, when they're like, so there's, there's this weird false sense of reality that happens. So they really think they know you and really think they know, you know them, there's a familiarity. So when you do these projects, you know, some of them are jobs and some of them, whatever, but the, almost every one of them may mean something to somebody who's watching and you never know what that is. Uh, like a show like Seventh Heaven, because it was on for so long, it blows people's mind even still today when people when I'm traveling or I'm and I'm with friends or, or my girlfriend and people will be like, oh my God, that's you you're a guy from seventh heaven. I'm like, it was like 18 years ago was the last time I was on that. I don't I mean I'm I'm like, you know, I'm like a I'm like I've been road hard and put up wet. I used to be a handsome kid there. Um <laughs> and but but it was like it was an important show to their childhood because they associated it was one of the only shows that people could watch with their parents. You know, parents could watch with their kids because it was like family friendly. Yeah, um, even, during the evening time, yeah. Yeah, people have a, a, they associate a relationship with me or the actors based on the feeling they had at the time. You know what's that saying? People don't necessarily remember what you said to them, but they remember how you made them feel uh, or how you treated them. They remember the feeling. Of, so like, so for instance, I may or may not have accidentally went to a, uh, been forced um, to go to a, um, a club where people happen, there's a, a pole and people dance on that situation. <laughs> uh, it was for the buffet. Um, and this girl came up to me, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, lovely performers, she came up, she goes, hey, can I ask you a question? Were you on Seventh Heaven? And I was like, oh God, I really feel awkward right now because of the time and place. She's like, oh, I used to watch that with my parents my and my, my dad in particular, and it just brings me back. It's such a, it's such a good memory for me and a good uh, spot in my life. And I'm like, clearly, uh, but, I, but so that people associate these shows or these movies with the time and place, uh, uh, and some of them have such nostalgia about them. You're a part of their f the fabric of their lives, and maybe the if they watch it. Um, I, I remember my my ex girlfriend Stacy used to say, uh, my favorite show in the world is the Golden Girls because I watched that with my now deceased. A grandmother so she associates all the good feelings she has with her grandmother with that damn show because that was one thing they could do together so it's very similar so you know I, like anything sometimes this job like every job can be monotonous and lame and you're like but we, we have a, we're very i'm very lucky to, to have this job i know that um uh, and especially when you can make people feel feel better or maybe you know in those situations it is weird i don't think i totally answered your question but that would kind of is what came to my mind it's weird how these lines blur and things situations like that come up a lot like you know then, then there's that and then there's like what the hell's the name of the movie with the breakup with vince vaughn and jennifer aniston where i play video games and vince vaughn it's kind of being um, pretty iconic scene because he's so funny and people is like the, the amount of people mostly dudes that watch that movie like on repeat in college and they know every word from it and they associate that with like oh my god that's all time and like and that makes them happy so i see that when people come up and talk to me and like you know they want a high five and they want to talk about that 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 this shit i'm like that i like that that means something you know but you know then there's oh, that in those sorry um, everyone stepped on his nose. Every once in a while, you're like, "All right, that's enough." But I'm glad I'm uh, glad you and your buddies, your drunk buddies, had a good time watching the breakup. But uh, yeah, I'm a meeting dinner guy. Beat it. Uh, but yeah, that, the, the line blurring the um, that that's an interesting thing. When when you can, it is nice to know that you can, you know, maybe give some somebody somewhere a little bit of a make their day a little bit brighter. Yeah, that's cheesy, but it's kind of true.
No, I think there's something to that. But what about like, so, you know, especially as it pertains like 12 strong and um, only the brave. So you're playing these stories of like events that actually happen, right? Like, um, and, and I think we, we had touched on this a little bit, but like, where does that level of um, immersion, like, when does that transcend transcend like that kind of storytelling like that idea that like hey these guys might be exceptional and this crisis is obviously exceptional but there's something about that there that does tap into the overall human experience don't you think yeah think about that like especially circumstances like that where these guys might be exceptional at what they do in that one aspect of their lives and their job but they could just, and a lot of the rest of their lives, they could just be ordinary f- people, right? Like, because when it comes down to it, when they get out of service and they're like walking around, they're still going to Costco. They're still at Walmart shopping. Um, well, there's always the option not to go, right? Like that's true. Yeah, that's totally true. That that's a big one. So when you when you get to you know, play with those themes a little bit um, and, and think about an exceptional circumstance, you, you said it. There's people that do things that are essential. To, we'll stick with the military to the to the the mechanism that keeps the military running. That may not necessarily get a book written about them. Uh, they're not going to you know they're not going to be they're not going to get a movie made about them. So the, the the themes of playing people and playing circumstances and trying to harness what you're doing. You're also trying to be an actor. You're trying to give a performance that's authentic. But you're also trying to like. You know, you're trying to be good. And and then the other thing that comes into play is you're like, I hope this job gets me another job. So like yeah. let's 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 not suck. No, absolutely. And then and that that's a good transition. Um I know we've I've taken up a bunch of your time, man. I really appreciate it. But just one last thing I want to sort of talk about is that that idea of transition. We've talked about we've alluded to it throughout, but obviously in your profession transition is a very real aspect because even on awesome jobs they're eventually going to end and i think there's a lot of parallels with the military because no matter how awesome your day may be or your year may be or this tour may be the tour is going to end the day is going to come to a close your career is going to come to an end like even a four-star general one day is going to have the next day he's going to be out of uniform that day is coming right and so what is that like for you like has there ever what what does transition look like for you? I know for our listeners who are in the military, it looks a certain way. Is it similar or a hundred percent? No, it's interesting you bring that up. So do you know who Jay Glazer is? Jay Glazer is the Fox Sports commentator, the bald guy. He he started an organization with another young man uh, named Nate Boyer. Nate was an interesting dude. He he was one of the guys that joined military after uh after 9-11, he was in he was in special forces. Um, he finally finished his tours, came back, and at 31 decided he wanted to play college football. So he walked on at Texas, made the team as a long snapper, and then actually ended up being on the roster for Seattle for a minute before they uh, before they cut him. But he was he was on the field in a, in a uniform as a as a professional football player. But they saw a lot of parallels between the similarities of the transition you're talking about of athletes and men and women in the military and how you do this it's your whole life woven into the fabric of your dna your life your your social life your work life and then all of a sudden you retire or you're forced into retirement athletes you just don't get a job that tour is over they say what, what, for whatever reason, you you decide to to get out of the military, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, man, what's next? Um, and the answer. So I'll back up real quick. Uh, there are super so, tons of parallels too. So for me, doesn't and I, I talk to to George about this all the time because naturally my personality is like go 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 grind. What's the next thing? There are some people that aren't like that. George isn't isn't like that. That's not his. It doesn't come naturally to him. So, even if he gets a great job and he shoots something, that's going to end, and it's going to end in three weeks or three years, whatever it is. And then it's about finding the next one. And that, as an actor, 
we, I transition all the time. Like I've got two shows, one on the air right now on uh, the, the dark comedy with Kate Beckinsale on Paramount Plus. Tune in, streaming right now. Uh, and, oh, we're and gonna the, give you some. We're gonna get you some press, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> hell yeah, big time. And then uh, and then Cowboy Bebop. But I shot both those things during COVID. I got back this summer, um, and I haven't worked since. And you're like, I don't know. There is no guarantee that I'm going to work again. And that is scary as shit. But to go back to um, MVP, so Nate and Jay started this organization, Merging Vets and Players, and they started it out of the gym that I worked out at in L.A. called Unbreakable, the Jay started. Um, If you ever watch uh, Fox NFL football on Sunday, Jay is the short, bald, white guy that's like the he's like the behind the scene he's the one that breaks all the news he's a wonderful generous great guy um and he he saw a lot of mental health issues he saw a lot of people struggling and he just decided i've got this space let's just do something and it's continued to grow i actually have been a part of it since the beginning and then and i really recommend people um that are listening to your podcast to check into it they're growing chapters across the country i don't know if they're in dc yet um, but I just flew down to Dallas last week for the kickoff party for their Dallas chapter that opened up. Um, but I, it's an it's an incredible thing to watch. You just don't think about it because when you're in it, it's everything. And you think about like, yeah, I know I'm gonna retire someday, but hey, I got it. it's forever away. It's like forever. It's like, or um, this is gonna this is all good. Or, I, or when this tour is over, I'm just going to get another one. And I know you guys just get different assignments and different posts. And some are going to be better than others. Some are going to be better for you and your family than others. But you're so it's a constant transition. And it's dealing, learning how to deal with that transition. So uh, it's been a unique experience for me to watch and listen. Because I'm not, an, uh, I'm not, as I say at the meetings, I'm not an athlete or a uh, or a veteran, but I've played both <laughs> on TV, <laughs> and they're like, "Fuck you!" Um, uh, but so I get to watch these guys and listen to some of their struggles, man, and listen to like, you know, the day you walk out that door and you get your papers, you're on your own. I mean, I athletes and and and, uh, and veterans, prop the similarities are super. The parallels are crazy, like. Hey, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll invite you back for like the reunion for homecoming thing once a year. But once you walk out that locker room, you're, they took your key card away. You're done. Once you once you leave that base and you're no longer active, like you're not showing back up there for three meals uh, uh, the next day. So this your sense of self, your sense of stability, all those things are taken away. And the transition is is heavy, man. And especially for people like you, uh, the veterans that you like, there's a difference between being in, in the military your whole life in that structure, but then doing things like you do, going downrange, transitioning off of that to something else. You're constantly, so the I, I transition all the time from job to job and opportunity, but none of those things are like life-threatening for the most part. Um, I mean, obviously there's mistakes that can happen every once in a while, but um, you guys put your f-ing lives on the line all the time. You've got that level of stress and level of, of heightened heightened stakes and then all of a sudden like we talked about joking about all of a sudden you're just the dudes picking in 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 the carpool like taking kids to school and you're like what the is going on three months ago i was like staring down the barrel um or or constantly worried about ieds and now you're like looking at for potholes and and like just filling up your day the transition is crazy so um it's been fun for me to be a part of that a, a unique perspective to be a part of watching to be a part of mvp and to watch these guys men and women by the way um and it's grown and it's and it's incredible but yeah as as an actor it's something you have to deal with and i think that's one of the reasons that you're always hearing about actors being fuck ups being drunks and being drug addicts and because when you're when you're starting when you and i've had small levels of success and small peaks and, and certainly valleys and i've had tastes of like oh man this it's all going to be great i'm going to be rich and famous and then that movie just does not work and then you're like well now i have no job and i'm kind of starting from scratch again people that don't 
weather as actors, people that don't weather that. A lot of people become nutbags and they lose their minds because they achieve fame, they achieve some sort of um, some success, and you're only as good as your last movie or your last thing. And then if the next thing doesn't work or you can't get a job again for a little while, whatever for whatever reason, because you're not the flavor of the month anymore, that's when people struggle because your identity has become attached to your success or lack of success. Um, and I can only imagine that in, in, in for veterans, people getting out, it is, it's so easy when you're doing a job, a, a movie or a television show to just get in that routine. And I know that I'm showing up to work. I'm going to have, I'm going to the mess hall. No, we've not the catering. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to somebody's cooking for me. I know that I've got a job. I know I've got an income. Um, I know I've got this weird sense of it's got to be the same thing for you guys. You get stationed with different people and they be, you see them more than your families, obviously. So there's this weird sense of family. And then all of a sudden, like you're on a new post or you're, you're, your tour is up and you're, you're gone and you're with a new family. Like I got to start this whole thing over again. So it's the same thing as, as an actor or an athlete being going from team to team or opera or, or, or uh, veterans, obviously with uh, tour to tour. The only difference is your guys' lives are on the line. And that is a huge difference. Yeah. That is a huge difference. We're all being told what to do and what time to show up. Nobody's shooting at me. Yeah, well, you know, and, and it's not always like that. Yeah, like, sure, for sure. And I think what you're talking about, though, I think is really profound is that there is this sense that, like, yeah, the, the alligators closest to the boat are consuming my time right now. I don't really have a chance to really think longer term. And then once it happens, you're like, shit, I got to start all over. And, oh, by the way, at least for the military, and I'm, I'm sure it's Hollywood similar, my reputation is following me. Yeah, for sure. It is. So I'm starting a new family, like you said, but there's some baggage. Yeah. <laughs> or not. Or maybe there's expectations, and now I'm have to, I'm, I now have to rise to this expectation that, for, fair or not, could be unrealistic. And so... Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And we'll talk a little bit more about this MVP because I think that's a, a it sounds like a really great um, opportunity and really a great sort of uh, place for people to. Yo, I'm going to call him when we get off the line and see if there's anything happening in D.C. And maybe you should start something there, man. Maybe you should uh, or, or, or be a part of it. And, you know, and. Uh, you can zoom into any meeting at any chapter, anytime, so people don't have to physically be there. Um, but it, I, I, it really, I, I've been really impressed with this organization. Just again, I'm, I'm kind of looking from the outside in because I'm, but I'm not really because I, I go there and I do the, do the workouts with them, and then I, I do, you know, I, I just don't often talk because I'm. You know, I'm going to be like, well, I didn't get this audition I had today. And then when somebody's like, you know, no, two of my brothers committed suicide. I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand, man. I was up for this job and I didn't get it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, man, shut up. <laughs> uh, yeah, check, check up to your listeners. Um, MVP, Merging Vets and Players. Um, it started yeah. in Los Angeles. And it's really, it's a, it's a great, uh, their, their Instagram is, uh, I think it's just MVP. Um, well, we'll find it. We'll put it in the show notes for sure. Um, oh, I would get uh, I'll get Jay on here to Jay or Nate on here to talk with you too. Um, oh. uh, again, for those of you guys who listen, it's it's um, merging vets and players is the name of the Instagram page. Uh, you know, you go there. I've worked out there. I've gotten my ass kicked by Randy Couture uh, and Chuck Liddell. Like you know, you do like you go there. The the, the what they believe in is um camaraderie being a part of something um and having you know people having having your back um that, that when you retire or like you you might you know people just again people get dispersed so there's a lot of like where are where are these people that i counted on for for so long they're gone they're somewhere else in the world and now you kind of walk in the earth solo um, so they, they're trying to bring that sense of camaraderie um, and fellowship back together. But they also believe in um, movement, man, like getting together and moving and like getting getting a sweat, working out. So that part of part of their mandate, kind of what they do is work out and talk. It's not like the, you know, work out and just talk things through, talk about experience. And, um, and, and it's amazing. You got like 
Rob Gronk, Rob, Rob Gronk, how do you say his damn name? Rob Gronkowski coming to these things, um, even though he's not retired yet, but he's, you know, he's in town working out and he, you know, he comes and So these guys are working out with people that, you know, you, you like somebody in, somebody in the military might not think you have anything in common with, with these dudes, but you just do. You just do because everybody, you, know, you, you, you never know what people are going through. And like, you think that somebody's um, rich and famous and they got everything together. One thing that Jay says all the time that I love is that you got to check in on your friends that are the strong ones, the ones that you don't think need help. They're like, mm -hmm. you think you could check the ones that seem like they got all their shit together all the time. Those people are probably, you know, they could be potentially quietly suffering the most because they're like, you know, they're afraid to seem weak um, or afraid, afraid to seem like they need help. Um, so I don't even know how to f I tangent onto this, but it, well, it's, been, good, it's been such a, um, I love it. I'm, I'm proud of these guys and I, I like, I like being a part of it and experiencing as an example i was at this meeting in, in dallas last week and there's a girl who i was i happened to be there at the her very first meeting and now and she was just just gotten out of rehab and she wouldn't talk to anybody and her head was down and now she's one of the higher ups in the organization and she spoke this is five years ago i guess and i and i and then she started working at the gym and finished went back to college and finished in uh, Northridge, I believe Pepperdine or Northridge, one, or maybe both. Um, anyway, she's done in five years. She's gone from squalor to she's balling, and she's beautiful and cool. And she told her story to a group of people that, um, like 200 people that she didn't know. She grew up in a cult um, in Nebraska. She has seven, eight brothers and sisters. Seven of the eight of them were molested by her father. Um, she went into the military. She started using heroin. She got kicked out. She went back. Like I, I didn't even know any of this shit. I've just been around her forever, and the and I could just and I I was with her right before she went on stage to talk, and I was like, you know, I'm I'm so I didn't know she was about to say all this, and I was like, I'm I got to tell you, I'm so proud of you because I I was there the first day that you showed up five years ago, and you wouldn't make eye contact with people. You wouldn't talk to anybody. And now you're running this thing. And, um, you know, and she just says, listen, sometimes it's as simple as just knowing you can go somewhere and count on people to have your back. Um, and like, I don't think they're, they're not like rewriting history here, man. They're not doing, there's, there's no like psycho analysis. There's no, there's no genius. They're just kind of group of people. They're like, yeah, dude, I need some friends and I need to know that, uh, I can count on somebody. I can pick up the phone if I'm struggling, if I'm feeling dark, if I'm feeling like maybe I want to take my own life. And that's all. And it's it's a, and that's all they they do. And they just talk. You know, they just talk. And, and the parallels between all these people that are transitioning. It's scary, man. Transition is can be good, as we all know, but it's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Money, life, security, all that. Um, so we. As as an actor, I can only look at it from from my world. Is I I think, to be honest with you, man, I think I've weathered this storm of the the ups and downs better than a lot of my peers because I was an athlete. Because I had moments of success and moments of incredible failures almost daily. You know, yeah. like think almost about the same play, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Think about like you know. Just in practice, you know, you're getting great at every practice, great at every game, and you, um, and some days you're like, you know, it's like you said, some days that slant route's working, and other days they all suck. Well, uh, dude, I still remember when you made that fucking spectacular catch in practice, and then the next second you landed on your shoulder and you're out. Yeah, that's right, bro. That's dude, right. That's gnarly. I mean, I that's, that's a great that's example. Best thing I've ever done. And then, you know, and then something that stays with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it's crazy how that works. And I mean, so we're, we're just constantly as human beings, like, you know, I mean, we're just trying to evolve. We're trying to like do that. Everybody's trying to do the best they can. Um, and more than ever, I think, because of in social media and 24 hour news cycle and everything is politicized and everybody's an asshole and everybody's wrong. Like, who the hell's right of like, or who the hell's wrong if everybody's right? Um, so there's there's a level of stress that people are under more now 
FOMO, people were like, you know, nobody is as cool or as pretty or as happy as they look on their social media page. We all know that's bullshit. Um, but people, I mean, it's, 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 it's screwing with people's minds and people are on edge more than ever. And people are the, the ones that are willing to say, man, I need help. Those are the ones that are going to end up being better off. And the people that are not um, are silently struggling. And like, you know, I think as men or, or you know, in macho fields, let's call it military, veterans, athletes, people, people are like, no, I'm not supposed to ask for help because I'm supposed to be a tough guy. Or I'm supposed to be a, t- a tough woman. Maybe, maybe even harder potentially for a female in the military because you're in a man's world doing a man's job um, historically. So like, I'm sure they feel like, man, the women feel like, man, I can't ever show weakness or I'm just going to get, you know, I'm just going to perpetuate the stereotype that we can't do things. But the older I get, man, the more I realize in some of our conversations we've had, your experiences and some of your, the demons that you've dealt with after, just after serving, like the, the older I get, the more I realize we are all f***ed up, man. There's just nobody that's getting out of this. It's just, that's just it. And we're all carrying shit from our parents and we're, there's so much, you know, no matter how great, here's something that was pretty interesting. I, uh, you know, the comic Bill Burr, yeah, totally. Uh, I, I went and saw him on uh, Thursday night in Long Beach, and he he had this bit about he, he grew up in a pretty rough household. I mean, he talks about it in his comedy a little bit. And his dad was uh, I don't know if he was you know I don't well I don't, yeah, I think his dad was fa- fairly uh, well I don't know if abusive is the right word but fairly aggressive. Heavy he handed. Yeah, he will call it heavy handed. And he and he he was he talks about like how he knew that. You know, no matter what he did, he was going to make sure that he didn't pass that along to his kids and he wasn't going to be a f- up father like like his dad. And then he realized, like, you know, one day he's, he, he's never he never yells at his kids or he, certainly according to him, he doesn't yell. And he's certainly not heavy handed, but he's like he's got his own anger and something happened and he was pissed off and he's f- swearing and throwing shit around. And, and then he just looks in the corner and he sees his two and a half year old daughter like standing there crying like that. Dad, dad, why are you crying? And he's like, oh, my God, I'm just like my dad how i thought i was i thought i'm not um it's like we're, we're all obviously he did it in a funnier way and it made it was a lot more eloquent but it's funny how we're all just man people are just really just trying to do the best they can and um and the, the older i get the more i realize like nobody's got this thing figured out some people some people look like they do some people you know i mean there's certainly levels but maybe maybe money helps a little bit because you can have nicer things or maybe be a little bit more comfortable but Everybody's I the shit too, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's true. It certainly does. Um, but yeah, man, it's like you know, p- people are just, we're just, uh, we're just everybody's just trying to make make it through, and transitioning is a uh, part of, uh, and and I can only imagine what it's like for you guys, um, especially if you're in as long as you were. Where I mean, that's the fabric. That's did you do a full twenty or is it? more you did more right 20 in a couple months man but you know me man my foot was always sort of out the door <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like yeah. got a spell line but yeah no i mean it's not easy it absolutely is not easy no matter what because and i think what we're talking about is really profound is that idea like you got to capture the passion um and finding that community definitely helps you do that like you can't be alone on an island I mean, just like your story in, in the pre-show about being in New Zealand, like that was awesome, but you can't be there forever. I know, dude. <laughs> you know, logistically, know. it's not supportable, dude. Like you can't, at some point you gotta go out and do something, like you're gonna have to figure it out and you're gonna need to figure it out with other people. Um, so, I mean, that was a really good analogy, really good metaphor. Like you can't just stay on the island as beautiful as it is. Like you're gonna run out of food or you're gonna run out of support at some point. Um, Do you ever listen to um, uh, uh, Dan Carlin's Hardcore History? Mm-mm. It's a podcast called Hardcore History, and he really tackles a lot of him, him historical, like you know, the fall of Rome, um, the the whole World War II and the Pacific. Their incredible road trip uh, podcast. I listen to him when I'm driving long places. But it, it's really interesting when you look at the and, and he's a and he's a just a like a ninja of, of history and he he's so well read and so well researched um, and he really does really really 
takes time and, and effort to uh, to do to be accurate. But when when he talks about like when you like the Roman soldiers and how and the, and the whole campaign to continually like, conquering and growing the empire, like you can only go and as far as your resources allow you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it's really good for our listeners to hear some of this stuff um, because I think there is this natural tendency to only focus on. You know the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's for but, sure, dude. You know, but dude, there's four tires on the on the on the cart or whatever, right? And so just because uh, something isn't necessarily screaming for your attention doesn't mean that you don't need to reach out. And like you said, sometimes the ones that appear to have it most together are have this um this um perception that they are the strongest. They're tired of having to be that all the time, and so. That's right. Um, yeah, I think it's really, I, I think that's an important point for us to sort of take home. Well, well, dude, to close on transitioning, where where are you at right now? So we mentioned in the pre-show a little bit. So you got Cowboy Bebop coming out. Um, yep. That's on Amazon. Cowboy Bebop is on Netflix. It comes out November fourteenth or something. On November seventeenth, I'd have to look it up. Super. Uh, so check out Cowboy Bebop on Netflix. Yeah, and then right now. Um, I've got on Paramount Plus, the, the streaming network for CBS, same one uh, as uh, the most famous show on that platform right now is Yellowstone. Uh, right. I've got a show that came out a week ago, I guess. Yeah, a week and a half ago. There's three episodes out. They did two the first night and now one a week called Guilty Party, uh, starring myself. Um, I should say starring Kate Beckinsale, and then I'm in it. <laughs> uh, she, it it's a it's a goofy dark comedy. Um, yeah, I thought I, I, really, I think I saw a, an ad for that. Yeah, it's a, it's really well done. I'm had a great time on that one. She's she's uh, as talented as they come and terrifyingly smart. Actually, like her, when when she comes in a room, I'm like, oh man, this sucks. She's <laughs> so much smart, smarter and better and funnier than me. Um, yeah, she's terrific. So and then you had, um, what was it? Uh, the Little Fires one, right? Yeah, Little Fire was, was on Hulu, and that's with Reese Witherspoon and Kerry Washington. That, so that's out airing. I mean, it's on – next time you fly on American, you can watch that on American. I'll, I'll take the three cents. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and then I've got quite a bit of um, production stuff I'm working on. As a matter of fact, we uh, m – I've been chasing – I've got books and uh, – that I've optioned and life rights of people. We've got some really cool projects um, that we're kind of at the one yard line on. So we're, we're hoping. Um, and then randomly, uh, I believe in the next week or so, I'm meeting with uh, uh, David Goggins. You know who David Goggins is? The, uh, he's uh, He was a SEAL and then I believe he was a ranger or he did meet. He's and now he's an ultra marathon runner guy. He's oh. crazy. Yeah, yeah, like he just wants to. He just wants to do he's like a decent shape. Bro, the guy like he he does on an assault bike. He does two hours at around eighty RPMs. I do two minutes at seventy, and I got to take a forty-five minute break. <laughs> it's crazy. The guy, he's a. Uh, He's definitely pushes the the boundaries of what the human body's capable of. Um, interesting dude, man. Yeah, the, it's it, his book is called uh, "You Can't Hurt Me," um, and it. I I actually it's one of the the times I recommend doing the um, the the book on tape, the Audible, because they do an interesting thing. He kind of does a book on tape slash podcast because. The, the narrator of the book reads the art reads the chapters and then on his on the tape version of it they talk about it in between oh, cool. uh, so it makes it quite a bit longer obviously but it's uh it's pretty interesting to watch uh the way they they get things done that's a neat that's a neat idea yeah well dude i love seeing you man um, yeah this is awesome dude i'll do i'll get on here and talk all day long about myself you know that <laughs> the perfect guest yeah that's right you don't have to ask me questions i'll just 
I'll go through a whole experience. I'll do like a one man show here. <laughs> All right, man. Well, dude, thank you again for taking the time on your, I know your super busy schedule. So yeah, for everybody listening, please check out Cowboy Bebop. Check out all of Jeff's uh, work that he's got going on right now. Check out MVP, Emerging Vets yeah. and Players. Yeah, um, look up uh, MVP, Emerging Vets and Players, Nate Boyer and Jay Glazer. Um, and if anybody uh, wants to get involved in that, you just uh, reach out to Vic and I'll connect. Uh, and, I, and I will do a little research you can update your, your listeners on if uh, what the best way to get involved from, I believe – I don't know that there's a chapter there in DC in the DC area yet, um, but there are hey, Marines all over the world, man. So it's true. You know, give it zoom, a people zoom in all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, dude, again, thank you so much. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. And it's just, it's great to see you see again, brother, and to sit down for a little bit. You too, brother. I miss you. Love you. All right. Take it easy. Love you too, bro. Scuttlebutt is a production of the Marine Corps Association. I am Nick Wilson. That is Major Vic Rubel, U.S. Marine Corps retired. You may have also heard the voices of or contributions from William Truding or Nancy Lichman, editors of Gazette and Mother Neck magazines, respectively. Opinions expressed in Scottlebutt are just that, opinions, and do not represent any official stance of the MCA.